Welcome back to this week's Real Country File. It is episode 52, so we are one today. It, we have done 52 episodes of the Real Country File every Sunday since we started last May. Hope you've enjoyed it. What has been your favourite episode and have you watched every episode? Let us know. Have you seen us out and about filming? That would be handy to know as well. So this week's episode is sponsored by Border Plant Sales and they've had a muck event. So we're going to go and have a quick look at that and we're also going to dive into Harper Adams. So let's go and see what's been going on at the muck event. Welcome to Border Plant Sales. Today is our mock demonstration day with Shelbourne Reynolds today. Uh, we've got Edwin and Alex here from Shelbourne. It's Edwin's last day today. So we've got a surprise um, for him at lunchtime. Um, we have just gone for subways for everybody for lunch. Um, and then we'll be bringing Edwin's surprise out. We have got the Shelbourne Power Spread Pro working today, so we'll have some footage to show you of that. But first, Edwin has done us a little talk around the machine, so you can see how the best to get out of your mock spread in. Hi, my name's Edwin, I'm from Shelbourne Reynolds, and I would like to introduce you to our Power Spread range of mock spreaders. Um, there are six current spreaders in our range. Rain, the, the first one being the dairy, which is a 1600 gallon machine, right up to a 3200 gallon pro, which this machine here is. Um, th there are three different shear bolt systems on this machine uh, to give you maximum protection. You're not quite sure what you're going to put in the machine, so it could be a, a multitude of, of, of maybe an odd block or a, a lump of stone or something. So the first piece of protection you'll come across will be on these paddles that actually feed the rotor here. There is a shear bolt that runs along there um, and that enables this, shear, this paddle to break back and so protect the auger from any serious damage. If you've got something in this area here that you wanted to get out, clearly this gap here isn't very big. So built into this machine, is the ability to undo a little bolt at the back here and this whole spreading rotor is on a ram and it enables it to be hydraulically dropped to the floor and that enables you then to pull anything out that gets in there and that makes repairing it or or literally freeing it up very easily um, as you come towards the front of the machine what you'll find here is clearly you've got a pto shaft and this is where it enables you to pull this one off flip this guard across and then this will go on the bottom and that enables you to reverse the auger. So if you get a jam in there at all, it's very easy to unjam it itself and then you can pull it out. If I open this guard and in here, you'll see the drive line. So it's a very, very big drive line here. Um, obviously the, 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 the drawbar and all the components on this machine are the same as the 3200. She's just a little bit shorter. So you're looking at really the size of the machine you buy is the is the amount that you want to carry. Uh, this machine here you would be looking at around 10 ton and a 3200 you would be looking at something like 15 ton maximum. I don't quite know what to do here. I think I'm going to 
Do you want to cut the chunk out of that? I'll tell you what we're doing. We've got our chunk around in a while. All packed up for today. Thanks to everyone who came to the mock day today and to wish Eddie happy retirement. Um, if you like this video, like and subscribe and we'll try and create some more for you. Um, see you again. Have you ever seen a muck spreader on a cake before? Anyway, I'm still in the field of OSR. It's the one that I'm in most weeks, showing you the bit of the progress of how it's flowering. As you can see, it's starting to stop flowering now, but we've got plenty of pods forming, which is always nice to see. Now we're gonna head over now to Harper Adams to a Farm of the Future event and look at some robotic stuff. Keep your eye out for a robotic mower working in the background. Uh, we've, we've ended up with very large machines. Those large machines have not been good for our soils and are a, a major contributor to the fact we've got major soil compaction, which in turn has led to a plateau in yield. And then in the, concept, uh, the context of today's discussion also doesn't help with sequestration, water infiltration and all the things that we need to do as, as, as landowners and farmers going forwards. So if we could move to smaller machines, then we may be able to improve our soils. At the same time, we're also in, a, in, a, in, a, in the last two decades or three decades now, we've been talking about this concept of precision farming, trying to put the right thing at the right place at the right time in the right way. But the very large machines aren't very, uh, uh, aren't very good at that. You know, so if we take yield mapping for an example, the first combines to yield map in, uh, in the mid 90s had six metre headers. Now we have, uh, if you walk into a class dealership, they'll sell you a combine with a 14 metre header on it. So what that means is our, our, our resolution, our precision has got half as good in the, in the era of precision farming. The same can be said for spraying. There's a local farm to here that now runs a 52 meter wide sprayer boom. And that is putting a single rate on across that whole sprayer's width. Now there are technologies coming through to make that better, but that is essentially status quo. So again, if we had a system where we weren't limited by the human resource on our farms, i.e. an autonomous system, we could shrink the system, be kinder to the soils and more precise with our inputs. Now, as time has gone on, the things that have started to uh, drop in my head is also uh, that link in again to net zero is a possibility to move to different energy sources. So we've traditionally used diesel on farms because it's a highly dense energy source and we use a lot of energy when we're farming. But if we move to smaller, lighter touch technologies, it also opens up the door for electrification and different energy sources. And one of the machines we're seeing here today, uh, there's two that are electric and one is even solar powered. Okay, so these aren't, uh, and the whole point of today is to show you that these aren't just academic ideas anymore. When I started this in 2011, started this sort of study, area of study in 2011, it was all very academic. Now we have machines in a field practicing what I've been preaching for, for 10 years or more. Uh, so to come on to hands-free then, back in 2016, I was talking a lot about these subjects, but there was very little examples to look at. And what we tried to do here with hands-free hectare is give the world somewhere they could look to see automation in a field actually happening. So this very field behind us is a perfect hectare of land. And we used uh, cheap open source technology and conventional farm, but small farm equipment to essentially grow the world's first fully autonomous crop in 2017. So we drilled, sprayed, fertilized, and then harvested entirely autonomously uh, a crop of spring barley in 2017. We repeated that with winter wheat in 2018. Um, and, and, and essentially it, it worked in the sense the eyes of the world looked at Harper. I now have to go around the world talking about it and discussing this, this subject, so, which is great. Um, so, which is not very net zero. Um, no, so uh, the point is, we did a thing rather than just spoke about a thing. But then in the six years following that, the world has changed again entirely. And now there are other examples and other machines that we can bring together into one place and start talking about uh, if it's any good or not. Now, hands-free developed from a single hectare that was flare, flat, square, and, and very regular. We moved to a hands-free farm, which had five fields, 35 hectares of land, all irregularly shaped. We had uh, telegraph poles, oak trees, footpaths, all the things you have on a conventional normal farm in a normal place. Um, and we, are able, we were able to develop a system that could cope with all of those things and not only cope but thrive and, and we've got some pretty good yields off that area of land whilst we've been farming it. 
Furthermore, we've also done economic studies on this and we've shown that if you use the hands-free system, which is uh, small light machines used in swarms, so as your farm gets bigger, you use multiple units. Uh, we've done economic analysis on that that seems to that suggest 30 to 20 pounds a tonne reduction in costs when producing wheat. And critically, that cost saving is best on smaller farms. So auto, what that shows is there's an opportunity for automation to enable a move away from the big get big or get out of farming that we've, we've had over the last few decades. Uh, so automation could allow smaller family farms to become profitable, which is a really important thing. Finally, just to finish off where we've got to with hands free, um, We've now, um, we're now utilising our technology. We have two metre implements, we've got two metre seed drill, two metre combine, and we've got a sprayer that can spray at two metre intervals. So what we've done is we've grown a strip cropping trial about 500 metres from here. It's only a small trial, only half a hectare, but we're growing uh, wheat next to beans, next to barley. They're all going to be individually managed, individually harvested, so we don't have to separate them later or we're not using them as a feed crop. And basically it's about trying to move away from monocrops and get multiple crops into one place, increase biodiversity, increase our soil uh, capacities of doing sequestration, etc. Reduce our reliance on nitrogen. Um, and, and essentially that is a, you know, that strip cropping, pixel cropping ideas are not our ideas again. They've been talked about for a long time all around the world, but everyone comes against the same problem. And that problem is mechanization doesn't allow for it. But our system does allow for it. So we're having a go. Um, and then, again, that will be, a, I believe, a world first if we get our autonomously strip field going this year. So maybe all farms in the future will look like that with lots of robots working in the field. Who knows? Anyway, we've had a few videos sent in wishing us a happy birthday. Hello, guys. It's the Fenlanders here, Fenland Farming Adventures, and welcome to the Real Country Fall. Happy birthday! Yay! Woo! Cheers, guys. On to the next year. Happy birthday to the Real Country File. Um, one today, I was on the first episode, and now I'm on the one year anniversary. Love it. Just here in our yard this morning to wish happy birthday to the Real Country File. Hi everyone, just like to wish you a happy first birthday to the Real Country File. With me and, and all the cows grazing on this sunny day, we, we wish you all the best. A real country file just to wish them a uh, happy birthday. Uh, it's been a year since they, uh, they started, so I'm going to do a little video and send it off. I've got, I've got some horse coming, I've got one editing, I've got some bean drilling video, and it's a big cat, so it'll be a good one for you lot. Um, I'm just planting potatoes here, so we've got a long night. We've got a long night. I've got a fair bit to do, so busy, busy. I just want to wish the Real Country Fall happy birthday. I'll we'll just have a swing round the uh, 6150R lot with a standard SP200 uh, tank planter and a uh, basilia on the front. Uh, it's going nice, it's wet, it's real wet, uh, it's well wet, so thank you very much, I'll speak you soon. So that is it, it is our, officially our first birthday, so cheers. Cheers. Cheers, happy birthday the real country file. <laughs> there we go, we've got a cake as well. I'm going to blow it out. One, two, three. <laughs> Happy birthday, everyone, and thanks for watching for the year. Cheers.